Hey, Pool Chasers, welcome to episode 101. Have you ever looked at your finances and wondered where you could cut costs to help get through the summer months? I know we did that quite often, and many times we were looking at the big ticket items to try to cut those costs. But what we learned throughout the years was that it is the little things that made a big difference and really saved us money. On this episode, we discuss eight bad habits that you or your technicians may be doing that are costing you money. We think that with a few subtle changes, you will see a big difference in your chemical costs as well as be more productive throughout the day. We are joined by our good friend Eric Knight of Arenda Technologies for an episode that we wish we would have heard several years ago. So we hope you get something out of it and we hope you enjoy episode 101. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again on the podcast, Eric. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, happy to be back, guys. So for those that don't know who you are, can you introduce yourself and what your role is with Arenda? Sure. I'm Eric Knight with Arenda. I wear a lot of different hats. Uh, as discussed in the previous podcast, I don't really have a title. I go where the company needs me to go, sales, marketing, brand development, website, app, you name it. Uh, I'm in most of the videos and I do a lot of the trainings online. We do a lot of video trainings, even before COVID, Uh, company trainings one-on-one or uh, with small groups of companies. The whole idea is to help explain some of what we're going to discuss today in a way that's more relatable. So that's what I do. I'm customer facing with Arenda. That's what I do. Very good. Thank you. And you know, you had put on a webinar recently on Facebook and we thought the topic was really good. You know, many of the things that you discussed is, you know, some things that we've mentioned on the podcast here and there, but we thought it'd be a good, to, good idea to collaborate on a full episode about bad habits that pool service companies might have. <laughs> yes. And, uh, <laughs> I was wondering where you're going. Yes. But bad habits. That's, you know, how that actually came up because I teach all, all these classes at these trade shows and at the Western show this year. And if you're listening, whoever it is at the Western show who sets this up, nobody asked us what we wanted to teach or if we wanted to teach, <laughs> but we just got signed up. And so we're trying to figure out like, well, who signed us up? Like, First of all, we didn't get any, I didn't get an email about it that we get signed up for the same material that we taught the previous year. I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that. It's the same people. So actually, you know, it ended up working to their favor because I was going to completely abandon that and just teach something that I wanted to teach that would add more value to the attendees at the Western show. And I called it my six bad habits that need to stop. And that's how it kind of started. And I had a lot of fun with it. The original presentation uh, was not brand approved by the owners of Arenda, but I had some pretty hilarious photos in there of these bad habits. And we didn't (laughs) want to put that on Facebook Live, but um, I had a lot of fun making it. And really it was just, I made it on the airplane out to LA when I found out what I was supposed to be teaching. I'm like, you know what? No, no, I'm not teaching that. I'm going to teach about these habits that I see all over the country. (laughs) And I'm just going to see how it goes. I'm just going to wing it. So right. And that's, that's how the real habits life thing started. And it ended up being like one of the most popular things we've ever taught. So I'm glad you're bringing it up. Perfect. So you get the six and we added two on the other end, hence the uh, eight topics. So Love it. what is the uh, first topic of discussion? Well, I got to go by memory here. So I, I counted down the, the hands down. The biggest one is number one. So let's start at number six, not measuring. This is a problem everywhere. So people eyeball chemicals. Not measuring chemicals may not be a huge deal if you're off by a few ounces glugging liquid chlorine into a pool because you're you're just chlorinating. But it's a really big deal if you're not measuring muriatic acid. And if you're not measuring something like soda ash, which I understand is less common than muriatic, but not measuring chemicals is a real problem. And I'll ask you guys the question. And Tyler... I know you were on the <laughs> webinar. Greg, were you on the webinar on Facebook too? Yes. You were. 
Okay, you're, you're looking at it. I'm going to ask you. You look uncertain if you were. So here's the well, question. Well, because I, I saw, I got the notification and I put it up, and, but it. I was in the middle of working on something. So, uh-huh, but I, uh-huh. but I loved, um, there was so many things that caught my attention. So I had to kind of like turn it down because I had something pressing. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But it's, it still stings. <laughs> I listen to the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> All, right. All right. So here's the question. And to, to your audience listening, envision a 20,000 gallon pool. You have a 20,000 gallon backyard pool, very common size. When you get there, the pH is 8.0. Very common pH, especially on a liquid chlorine or a salt pool, the pH is going to rise. 80 pH on a 20,000 gallon pool. You need to lower that pH to 7.5. How much acid does that take? Don't look it up. Just have it. Hmm. Quarter gallon. Okay. Tyler? 33 ounces. <laughs> you guys actually got it right. Um, I only got it right because I cheated. You know, that's the second time I've heard it. But uh, Greg got close. Greg got closer than I did. I guessed half a gallon the first time, so... You, you did, you did I good. got lucky. There was no <laughs> math behind what I just did. I have been asking that question pretty much everywhere I go around the country when we were still able to travel. And I would say over 90% of people answer a half gallon or more. I've heard other than you guys here and, and you know during the Facebook Live because people were looking at their phones. I've heard less than 10 people say a quart, a quarter gallon. It's almost always a half gallon and up. And that's a really bad habit because the actual answer is about a quart, depending on your alkalinity. I think at 90 ounces, it's like 31 and a half or something. And then at at 80 alkalinity, it's going to be a little less. It'd be like 28 ounces. At 70 alkalinity, it'd be like 25 ounces or whatever. So the less alkalinity you have, the less acid it takes, which makes sense because you have less alkalinity to burn through. But the point is, it's about a quart. And if 90% of the industry, and these are not dumb people, these are, they have a lot of aptitude. These are good service professionals that have been making a career out of this. They say a half gallon. That's twice the acid you actually need. And what do you think that does to the LSI? It actually, we did the math, it actually drops your pH to somewhere between 6.7 and 6.8, which plummets your LSI, which causes an overcorrection. And then, you know, if you have a cement based finish, plaster, pebble, quartz, anything like that, uh, well, you're going to etch that. And then you get calcium hydroxide, which has a 12.6 pH. And you get this chemical conflict, which leaves uh, behind over time, it can turn a plaster surface that's colored into a white mark. It can lose pigment. Uh, it can cause localized scale crystals like on the uh, pebbles of a pebble finish, like at the bottom of the pool. It's really a lot of conflicting chemistry simply because nobody took the time to actually dose and figure out how much acid does that actually take. They followed a habit, and that's a really bad habit. So there's two kind of two sides to it. Number one is they don't dose right. Like you got to know, which we'll bring into habit number five. You got to know how much chemical the pool actually needs and then use a measuring cup. Actually take the extra 10 seconds and measure it because that's a big deal. So that is habit number six. Does that uh, fully explain it? You guys have questions on that? Yeah, man. I, I used to, when I heard that, I was cracking up and I, I actually texted Ty <laughs> and I was like, I wonder if a Starbucks venti cup counts. <laughs> Because I remember first year, that was definitely my go-to uh, shocking cup. Hey, there's some measurements. Hey, a venti is, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. 24 but ounces. Kudos for your honesty. I, guys. I actually, one of the one of the most clever one that I saw, uh, I'm not endorsing this, but this is what they said. They use, uh, the guy uses a Pedialyte bottle because mm. the neck closes off on the top and it's exactly a quart. And so he'll pour hmm. acid in the Pedialyte bottle because he can put a cap on it so he doesn't risk spilling it. And then he takes that into the backyard. I'm like, interesting. that seems like an, an extra step, but at least you know your solid measurement that you're not going to overdose if that's all you bring into your backyard. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of a, a one way to do it. I don't, look, here's the thing. <laughs> Just get a measuring cup. They're like three bucks. <laughs> you know, like you need a good liquid measuring cup that can hold up to about a quart and you want a good dry measuring cup for granular chemicals like Cal hypo shock or calcium chloride, whatever. 
but also making sure that you have the proper PPE for all this stuff, because that yes. that is very, you want to educate your team on how to do this stuff correctly. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing that, you want to make sure that if you are transferring it from the bottle to another measuring device to go into the pool, the fumes are going out twice now. So for last sure. thing you want is because it's now going from bottle to pool with that could be about three feet or if you're doing it how you're supposed to a little bit closer but now you're doing it into a measuring that's a foot away from your face you know a foot yeah. or two away from your face yep. that is extremely dangerous yep well it's 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 much different you're right protective gear glasses and gloves especially with with ventilators I, i'm not sure ventilators are necessary if you're doing it right because you know there's usually a cross breeze i'm not try not to inhale deeply while you're pouring it but it can absolutely harm you if you get too close to the muriatic acid or chlorine and never mix the two, right? I should add an extra habit, except it's not a bad habit. It's just like a safety precaution. Never mix chemicals together directly, mm -hmm. ever. Rule of thumb, never, ever mix chemicals with another chemical. I was just going to say that when you said measuring cups to make sure that your measuring cups stay with that specific chemical because you don't want to mix. Yeah. You don't want, or yeah, I guess, or you can rinse them, but like, you don't want a cow hypo measuring cup being wet. I mean, that's. be like Greg Viafania circa 2017. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you blew up. <laughs> Dude, I blew oh. up a caddy, oh. a blue caddy. I had shit no. mixed in every direction and I put the caddy down, like kind of jarred it. I don't know if that was what it needed to kind of mix but this dude it blew up about two <laughs> feet off the ground my ears were ringing like in a, for, in a backyard right by the right fence. at the gate yeah. and their garage was open and i remember like i remember like i i backed away i'm freaked out i'm like holy shit like what <laughs> i don't know of anybody that this has ever happened to and oh my gosh yeah it was so what mixed Cow hypo and types of chlorine. Cow hypo and uh, oh, yeah. tabs. Yeah. And a little oh. bit of water. And a little bit of water because, mm -hmm. you know, your your yeah. testing stuff is in there and you're grabbing stuff. Your hands are wet. And we I, used remember, to I was the... like terrified to go and pick <laughs> because it was like oozing yeah. like over yeah. the top of this thing. And I'm like, dude. We used to have a really bad habit of putting like a cow hypo scoop into the bucket, like just full of cow hypo. So you don't have to make an extra trip to the truck. And then that habit stopped when, when that happened. <laughs> when I lost my so hearing. Cal hypo is extremely horrible. volatile. So yeah. just rule of thumb, if any different types of chlorine touch each other, it's an explosive or fire risk. Yeah. No uh -huh. matter what, it's dangerous, right? Yeah. And if you mix like acid with any type of chlorine, it can create toxic gases that can kill you mm -hmm. if you consume, you know, if you inhale enough of it. That's really not a prevalent problem so i didn't include it with my bad sure. habits that i see everywhere the six bad habits that i had like they're everywhere i see them all yeah. over the country very very common that's a safety thing and i great story i'm glad you're alive to tell it uh i've seen me too i've heard of stories where entire factories blow up it happened like what a year ago or two years ago yeah i think i think that happened you know at a distribution center here in arizona so uh, uh, there was one ago. in new jersey not too long ago that it was you know, probably consider it like a five alarm fire that chlorine. I mean, it's, it's a powerful disinfectant, but it's a powerful oxidizer too. It's just not a very good oxidizer against bather waste, but it's a great oxidizer. If it's out in the open and you can burn things, chlorine is extremely flammable. So yeah, like I said, Greg, great example, <laughs> stay safe, protective gear, yeah. glasses and gloves, keep your chemicals separate, all that stuff. So my um, pool service career is over. Nobody's going to hire me now. <laughs> no, yeah. But, yeah, but look how, look how authentic you sound on your podcast. People are like, Oh, he learned his lesson. Yeah. But I mean, that was like year one or two in, I mean, we yeah. learned a lot a after a lot of those stupid mistakes, but it's about learning when you do mess up that bad. You're lucky you learned it that way and not with it in your truck on the highway or something <laughs> like that. Right. So. But we do 100% agree because this was always a freaking difficult area was, you know, actually measuring things correctly, even down to the DE, the diatomaceous earth, when we were doing filter cleans. I mean, didn't we start bagging, mm -hmm. bagging the DE up? Because it was like this specifically goes to this filter clean after this yeah. filter is complete because it's for, you know, this side, yeah. this size DE filter. So a lot of a lot of why we did that six bad habits was about money. It was, yeah. you know, let's not charge our homeowners any more money here. Let's just find profit that you're leaving on the table. 
that's really what it's about. It's, it's, it's inefficiencies. You guys are wasting time and money with these bad habits and they don't really save you any time. Not much. I mean, how much time does it take you to measure acid before you pre-dilute it and put it in a pool? An extra 10 to 20 seconds? Come on. I mean, it's if you're just, fighting with baby mama and you got all this other shit going on, <laughs> well, it's not that easy, Eric. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait, you know what? You're, you're, the, you're the man that's bringing my theory into the real world. And I appreciate that about you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. That wasn't what me, but to, the phone way. people in the backyards. <laughs> what a way to derail me, man. That's great. So, yeah. So, get a measuring cup. Use it. Um, that's, that's bad habit number six on the countdown. So, that's the first one. Uh, and if you do that, let's think how many roundabout round numbers, how many pools did you guys have in your service company? 400, 400. Okay. Let's just say that all of your guys were doubling the amount of acid that they needed to because of the habit of half a gallon. Oh, they for sure were. Okay. <laughs> so how much money that you spent could you have profited on? And that's, by the way, that's just the acid. That doesn't include the bicarb because you tanked twice the amount of alkalinity that you were supposed to, and you had to replace that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't include the extra time either mm -hmm. to, to correct this chemistry. And it's all because it wasn't dosed and measured properly. And that's a, a, that's a habit that's free to change. So For sure. that's the first habit. But no, I think that's a benefit of us having a conversation about your six topics because, well, now we have eight on the here, but... When yeah. we, when I was listening to you talk, I, I mean, we, Greg and I were texting back and forth. I'm like, we were, we were talking about measuring chemicals like a lot towards the end of running the business about how much money we were wasting, how much money was out there that our guys don't, you know, maybe don't comprehend exactly yeah. how much they should actually be putting in the pool. So that was a big conversation. And when I heard you say that, I was like, oh man, you know, we've talked about oh, it a lot, but it's a big, it matters, it's a big problem. Guys, it matters a lot to a one polar. Oh yeah, for sure. For a company like yours. <sighs> yep. It's I mean, a ton that's, of money. That's a lot of pools. So ton of money by any stretch. Uh, so the next habit really ties into that, and that is not measuring pool volume. If you don't know the volume of your pool because you never measured it, and you just eyeball it and said, "Ah, it's about twenty thousand gallons," or "That's uh, about fifteen thousand gallons," how do you really know? I mean, in the real world, uh, most people are off by several thousand gallons, myself included. And there's a lot of reasons for this because. Uh, let's say that your customer didn't build the pool. They bought the house that had a pool. Well, of course, the realtor is incentivized to exaggerate the gallonage of the pool. And I actually went to a pool that was a problem. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, this is a 35,000 gallon pool. And I looked at it I'm like, well, uh, it's not a 20 foot deep pool. So no, it's not. Like, <laughs> right. It's not. It's nowhere close. It was, it was 22,000 when we measured it out. Hmm. That's the closest we could estimate. 22,000. That's a third, pretty much. So they were overdosing by that much, 30% more than they needed to. You do the math on that on anything. And by the way, if they thought it was 35,000 gallons, what do you think double the amount of acid on that is? A whole on gallon. top of what they you know, see what I'm saying? Like it yeah. really gets out of hand fast. So if you don't know the volume of your pool, you cannot get accurate dosing. The LSI calculator we have in the Arenda app is only as good as the information you put in it. So the habit change here is don't assume, you know, the volume of any pool, mm -hmm. unless you are the builder or, you know, the builder and they gave you a very specific gallonage. So to correct this habit, the, the easiest way to do it is contact the builder. They, if it was built in the last 10, 15 years, they're going to have software that should, they should have software that'll tell you the gallons of that pool. It's never going to be perfect because the guys shooting the concrete are not going to get the contours exactly like the software says. So you're, you're always going to be off by a couple hundred gallons at least, but you're going to be really close. That's the most accurate way you can do it. Um, and that's the easiest. It doesn't really take you any time. Just call the builder, find out what it is, or have the homeowner do so. Yeah. Once you have the number, write it down on the equipment set in a place that's not going to get washed off with rain or anything like that. Like maybe inside the controller panel on the inside door, somewhere weatherproof. All it takes is a Sharpie or a sticker, like one of those sticky label machines that you can print out a little thing. Whatever it is, have it on site. 
because if you can't make service that week and you have to have one of your buddies in IPSA or UPA go over there and treat that pool, um, they need to know what the gallonage is. And it'd be really cool if you guys coordinate as local chapters or as service companies that, hey, we always have the volume of our pool right above our branded sticker here on the equipment set. It's always in the same place. That's going to be a lot easier for the next person who comes in. And, you know, hopefully you maintain that pool as a customer, but the reality is it's what's right for the homeowner, whether you have that pool or not. That homeowner does not know how big their pool is. Take it to the bank. So find that out. If you don't, there is a formula. We have a blog about it on how to approximate and how to measure your pool volume, where you're basically trying to measure the dimensions of the pool and be as accurate as possible. And you're trying to get the cubic area, the cubic volume of that pool. And so you take the surface area times the average depth as accurately as you can do. And then you apply a multiplier to it. So for gallons, like what we do, it's 7.48 gallons in every cubic foot of water. So it's a multiplier. It's just a simple equation. On our Renda app, we have a pool volume estimator that applies that exact formula. So you just put in the dimensions and we're, we're updating our app. So it's going to look better. It's going to look different, but it's, it works just fine. You just put in the dimensions, it will calculate the cubic area, and then it will apply that multiplier and it will give you an estimate of what the volume is. It's pretty quick, easy to use, but you have to do the dimensions. So one of the questions I get a lot is how do you measure the depth? Well, you have a pole, don't you? You take the head off the pole, you take the brush off and you put that pole down, you mark where it is. And I've talked to pole manufacturers, if they're listening, put measurement graduations on these poles. It's a tool. Like the pole is an essential piece of the pool guy's route. You can measure things out. You can measure the dimension across by laying the pole across a pool. You can definitely get depths, be as accurate as you can. And with these free form pools, these real fancy ones, I realize it's a lot harder. Um, do the best you can, but the, the best way to do it is contact the pool builder. And for those pool builders who are listening, and I know there are a lot of pool builders in your audience, you guys, kudos for that. Make sure you tell the homeowner the actual number. Don't exaggerate. Please don't exaggerate. We see it all the time. Oh, the pool builder built me this, this great 25,000 gallon pool. It's like 16,000 gallons. The, lying to a homeowner and saying that it's not, I'm not accusing pool builders of doing that, but maybe the sales guy did. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like it happened. It's, it's actually a really big problem. It happens a lot. So hmm. the service guy's under the impression that it's a certain amount of water. Well, that's screwing over the homeowner and the service guy. So do your due diligence. Find out what the actual volume of that pool is as accurately as possible, and then write it down. That is the next habit. Yeah, you started doing that towards the end with all your bids because you realized how important it was to everything. Yeah, no, that's all really good advice. And putting it on the board with a label maker or engraved plate or whatever you can get your hands on, but adding that to your CRM and whatever pool service route software you're using so that that is one of the key things that pops up so that when a technician gets there's a picture of the pool, the house, whatever it may be, they know that this pool is 20,000 gallons. So if they are having to add acid or bicarb or anything for that matter, they know how big the pool is. So you're taking that out of the equation. They're not having to walk it out. I don't think they're going to do that anyway. We didn't really have anybody that would have done that. So right. I think starting the, when you're taking on a pool for pool service anyway, start that relationship off on the right foot. And that's by oh, yeah. doing everything, looking at the equipment, measuring the pool and putting all that data. Because if you're taking the time, even if it took two or three hours to do, you're saving yourself so much time and aggravation because even if a technician is new and they might not know something, it's so much easier to have all the photos and all the data. And they say, I have to, the chemistry is showing me this, or the pool looks like this. And it's like, okay, well, I can see that the pool is 20,000 gallons. And if this is true, what you're telling me, you need to add this much. And how I got there was A, B, and C. And you can right. do that because you have the data, not, you don't know anything, but yeah. you've collected all of that stuff. Uh, and here's a step further. You know, remember, go the extra step. 
doesn't take an extra mile. It's just an extra step. If you are trying to retain that customer and add value, one of the easy ways that you can do it is make little sticky cards or stickers. You just buy like Avery stickers at Staples or something, print your logo on it, print your company name and logo, phone number, email, your contact information, and put a line under it, pool size, and just write it with a Sharpie and stick it on the inside of the equipment. Yeah. Now you're branded. You've branded that number. You measured it. Like That's a, awesome. like a you blank added one. value to that home. Yep. It's cool. Yeah. Like a blank so, box so that you could put them on all of them and yeah. write it in. Yeah. That's exactly That's a good idea. Right. So these little things are things that are going to help that homeowner and future homeowners that are going to own that pool. So. That's what it is because people don't usually, they usually inherit a pool. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's that's where it's really huge is a new pool company gets a pool or a new homeowner bought a house with a pool. All the information is there. It's not, well, it was the pool guy, three, four pool guys ago is the one that has all the information and the pool builder's not around anymore or right. there's no way of telling who the builder is. <laughs> so yeah. the, there's there should be no secrets with the volume of a pool. That should be printed <laughs> public, you know, Seriously, because it, it's it's a big problem. Yeah, it's yeah. a big problem that compounds into almost all the other habits, except the next one. If you're ready to move on to the next one, I am too. Move on. Okay. <laughs> Do not ignore water temperature. Everyone ignores water temperature. Temperature is a monster factor in the Langlier saturation index, which we went in depth in on the last podcast. If you don't know what the LSI is at the bottom of the Arenda app, you'll see a number that says LSI. That number is the objective measure of how balanced your water is. Not how chlorinated it is, but how balanced it is. And as you touch on the Arenda app and you lower the temperature, you're going to notice the LSI goes way down. So if you go from 90 degree water and you drop it to 40 degrees, it's a very different LSI. Right. And we often make the mistake out of habit of trying to stay within range chemistry parameters year round. Well, guys, January is a little colder than August, isn't it? Yes, sir. Well, you then. need different chemistry <laughs> because people don't think about the water temperature. Water temperature matters. It matters a lot. So the habit change, number one, get a thermometer. If you don't have a thermometer, they're only a few bucks. Uh, I have one on a string. I think Pentair makes it. Uh, great little thing. No batteries, analog, and it's super reliable. This is, a, this is a very simple technology that's very proven. Of all our testing equipment, thermometers are probably the most reliable of anything. No reagents needed. It's also put it, a put it in to, the put it in the cost when you're yeah, doing the pool that's service a good way to make money. and say, hey, we're going to... Every pool should have one of these, and this is the importance of it. We're giving yeah. it to you, and brand that bad boy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Right. Stickers so, everywhere. <laughs> I, actually, there's a service company, a pretty large service company. I won't say who or where, but he, he's asking the question for his guys. He's got a lot of guys like, oh, man, how do I incentivize them to get these thermometers in these houses? I said, easy. Let them keep the profit. You buy, you buy a thermometer for a few bucks at distribution and sell it for a few dollars more. Let them keep the two or three dollars profit. You don't gouge a homeowner. I mean, you yeah. can sell it for under 15 bucks. Who cares? But that, but that guy's got 40 pools on his route. Dang. You know, 40 pools and he's making five bucks a pool. That's 200 bucks in his pocket. Hmm. That's not a bad incentive to sell these thermometers to homeowners. And a lot of them already will have it, but I will tell you a comfortable majority of them don't. Not over here. And they all need one. <laughs> not, not in Phoenix. And it's going to get hot. Yeah. Get a thermometer. So the action step here is use a thermometer. Don't just have one. Use it. Keep it with your test kit. Tie it to your test kit. Do something. Those of you who have the fancy like infrared ones, great. Make sure that you have an extra pair of batteries so it doesn't die mid-route but take multiple readings. If you're using the infrared, look at the deep end, look at the shallow end, look at the middle, aggregate those numbers. They're gonna be close, but they're gonna be slightly different because those things are super specific. I do not like using the equipment set controllers have thermometers on them sometimes. They give a temperature readout. That's it's the in temperature the in the plumbing. Yep. I don't like using that as the primary gauge. It's fine if it's running 24 or seven, it's gonna be close. I wanna know what's in the actual pool. Get a thermometer on a string, sell one to every homeowner, encourage them to buy them. They're only a few dollars. It's not a lot of money, but it will bode very well for your long-term chemistry strategy if you know where the 
where the temperature is because how cold is cold? I was at a pool, I guess it was over a year ago now. It would have been not this past winter, but the the winter before. I'm at a pool and it's so cold when I'm trying to get chemi- chemistry readings to get a water sample that my hand is like shivering and it's it's hard for me to gauge. So I know I have to warm up the sample of water to get an accurate water reading, which is part of this habit. Don't just take water chemistry readings when the water is below 50 degrees. To be safe, below 60. If it's cold to the touch, warm it up. Test the water. The readings will still be accurate if, if, if it's 70 degrees, 80 degrees, or 90 degrees. But if it's, if it's too hot, like over 90, it may not be accurate. And if it's too cold, below 50, 55, 60, depending on the manufacturer, so you just want to warm it up to like room temperature, then get the readings because the reagents in these test kits, or if you have a digital one, they have dry reagents. They are temperature sensitive. They are not always the same temperature. So anyways, I'm digging this out, but I, at the time I didn't have a thermometer because I flew to this place. It wasn't my test kit. I didn't have a thermometer with me. I didn't bring it through TSA, right? Well, my customer didn't have a thermometer. I'm like, ah, oh, it's cold. I don't know. It's it's probably 50, right? So the next day after I leave and move on, that customer called me. He said, it's 37 degrees. Mm. <laughs> 37 Big degrees. Difference. That's a 13 degree difference. You do that on the LSI calculator, that's a difference. Mm-hmm. All right. So there, you, you have to know what the temperature is. And when you know what the temperature is, you can predict what is going to change about that chemistry before it happens. You know it's going to be getting colder in the fall. Act accordingly. In the springtime, you know it's getting warmer. Act accordingly. So don't (laughs) ignore water temperature. Get a thermometer, plan, and act accordingly. Right. And I think that keeps you on your toes because how many pools did we see that were having algae issues and things like that? And we're like, dude, it's freaking December, January. But you didn't realize that the pool is now 103, 104 degrees. Right. And you never even knew that they heated this pool, but there's... There's a lot of pools that are actually heating up and that is a huge difference mm-hmm. where you're used to coming to this pool every week and it's 60 degrees or whatever. And it's right. like, oh, all of a sudden now it's 104. I have to treat this pool completely different because if it's heated, they're also going to be using it much differently yeah. as well. So those are all things to help keep everybody accountable where it's like, oh, mm-hmm. oh, snap. We want to thank Pentair for supporting the show. You know, as a podcast for pool professionals, we know that when you sell products, it's your reputation on the line. And when they are Pentair products, it's theirs as well. That's why Pentair's got your back with their trade grade program, which supports your business and reputation by offering exclusive tools and support for lead generation, attractive product rebates and longer warranties, and an unmatched expertise when it comes to accurate equipment selection, setup and service. So to learn more about how trade grade protects, empowers and helps your business grow, Visit Pentair.com forward slash trade grade. That's Pentair.com forward slash trade grade or click the link below. Well, I would like you to interject one of your two habits at this point, because I've gotten through three of mine. I've got three left. You had two. What's your first one? (laughs) Choose wisely. (laughs) Yeah, I'll talk about you. You guys added it. You added two. So it's the eight habits. I only had six, you know. So what I want to talk about is the big habit of being on your phones in the backyards and also being on your phones throughout the route. If you're a one polar and you're running the operation or you are taking a lot of the calls, I kind of understand, you know, there's, there's different variables within this, but I think there was a lot of time where we had different technicians with different habits. One of our technicians would be at the door at 530 when we opened and he would finish his pulls around 11, 1130, but he didn't mess around. He was on his phone. He wasn't taking family phone calls. He was going from stop to stop to stop. Maybe, you know, took a little bite to eat, but kept going. And then we had other technicians that would come in around the same time, but for some reason they get done with their pulls at like 4 PM. And I know being the owner and Greg being the owner that like that, those routes aren't that much different and their skill sets aren't hugely different. So what is the factor and why is this person taking so long? And you know, we found out that they take these breaks on their phones and they, they'll be on Facebook, they'll be on Instagram, they'll be calling their girlfriend or their buddies and talking the whole time. 
which is a huge distraction from water chemistry what you're supposed to be doing anyways with that smoke part breaks. of it. Smoke breaks are a big deal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the reason I bring it up is because I see a lot of complaining out there that, oh, I work Saturdays and oh, I work Sundays, seven days a week, or oh, I work all this t extra time. But really a lot of those times I think is because you're not using your time accordingly and not using it, you know, how you should be. And then you're prolonging those days and prolonging those pools to the weekend. Yeah. So that's, that's what I wanted to bring up. I understand there's different variables within that. And some people need to be on the phone. Some people that's have great. emergencies, but there's a big, I think, piece of that where people are just wasting time in there's awesome uses for Facebook groups and awesome uses for Instagram while you're out there, you know, if you're using it to promote your business, but be strategic with that. If you want to take pictures for Facebook or Instagram, take them and then post them later or take them and plan them later. You know, there's lots of social media like apps out there that you can set different times or release points. So you could take a picture today or release it tomorrow, things like that, you know, that could really save you a ton of time. And like we said, time is time is money. So that's a big one that, I've noticed. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a really good one. You touched on two things that I think definitely bear repeating. The first one, and this is huge. I, I it should probably be my seventh habit, but it's not. It's not as prevalent anymore as it probably was ten years ago. Do not smoke in a homeowner's backyard. No, a lot of people don't like smoking. I know I don't like it. If you smoke, that's your habit. Keep it in your truck. But, but the big problem here is not that you're smoking in the backyard. What do you think? What do you think the homeowner finds? Cigarette, Cigarette butts. butts. That is an absolute deal breaker. Never, ever, ever put yourself in a position where you could even possibly leave a cigarette butt in a backyard. And I've heard, uh, I've heard service companies that are our customers say this to their guys. Like they have written policies. Some of them do not smoke. And there's actually a really good service company. They got a lot of guys. And they fine them fifty dollars if they smoke on a homeowner's property. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, <laughs> well, you know what? It's a bad habit. It is. Now, it's not as prevalent to make this top eight list that you have here. But that that time management thing is huge. Time management is profitability. It's the same way you have to get through any business. And I think a lot of service techs that don't own the service companies don't understand the profitability aspect of it. It's just a job, but. Take an ownership mindset, get through your work, do it right. And if you do it right, like your gentleman who started at 530 in the morning and was done before noon, he's got all the time in the world to post all those pictures he took on Instagram later, mm -hmm. which get through the work, get it done, do it right. That's an awesome one. I think that adds a lot of value to the list. To be honest with you, I kind of wish I came up with it, but <laughs> as evidenced, I was not a pool service guy. So, and I don't pretend but, to be. So you guys are uniquely qualified to know this. My list of six are things that I have personally seen sure. that I have seen all over the place. I wanted to add one thing because it was really difficult having team members that did smoke because they were really good at what they did and know that there's a lot of people listening that probably have team members that do smoke and it's a really difficult discussion to have with them. But we did talk about this and we never got to implement it, but I think it's a good idea to maybe try and pay for if you can or insurance or just pay out of your pocket, but maybe help them quit. Maybe there's some different things that you programs that you can get them on so that you can help them quit. And maybe that will actually help with the conversation where it's like, Hey, you know, this is maybe use other words, but it is a bad image for the brand, for the company to your, your arms hanging out the window, you're smoking, you have all these chemicals, you're in a backyard, you're smoking, you're leaving yeah. all your, um, you know, uh, cigarette cartons and things like that in the backyard. But having that talk where it's like, Hey, we can't have that. We're not letting, we're implementing this new policy, but you know, we want to help you. And, you know, we want you to live a long time. We want you to be here. Um, so maybe we can help you get on a program. Are you interested And maybe they're not interested, but I think if it were me, I would, I would take that much better than just no do it and you're and you're done right. but it's like you know what yeah. we want to help you you know you can take it or you can just you know go to the park and have your smoke when you need to or you know whatever but you know coming up with a uh, an idea because we know that it's not that easy to just because that used to drive me like 
freaking nuts <laughs> when he'd be yeah. actually doing the plumbing and doing all this stuff and you know smoking but it's like cigarette hanging out of the mouth yeah but he was but he was really good and good with talking with the customers and all those different things so it's like there's a lot of people that understand that sometimes it, it is difficult to have those conversations because that sure. guy's like yeah screw it like Look, i'll go I, work I, for I somebody that i don't throw stones i don't judge a guy for smoking if you're going to smoke fine when i draw the line if i'm if I owned a service company, I draw the line with doing it in the homeowner's property and leaving the even the risk of leaving cigarette butts. If you're going to smoke, smoke in your truck. Yeah. Okay. But be responsible about it. But yeah, again, it is, we all know it's an unhealthy habit. So I think that's an awesome thing because now you're actually helping that employee beyond paying them a paycheck that they may not see it as help at first, but it, it is a, a good thing to help someone quit if, if they're willing to. You know, yeah. you can lead a horse to water, but you yeah. can't make them drink. So, um, very, very good point. I love that added habit. Sweet. Time management, <laughs> smoke breaks, all that stuff. Cool. What's your next one? Well, uh, number three on the list, we started at six, which was measure chemicals. Five was measure the pool volume. Four was don't ignore water temperature and use a thermometer. And now we're on number three. Number three is do not neglect your test kits. Boom. The test kit is the most important piece of equipment, one could argue, that you have in your truck. Second, probably only to your phone. But that's a communication device. In terms of pool chemistry, it is super important to take care of your test kit because that is going to be guiding most of the decisions you're going to be making on that pool. We see it all over the place at any distribution center that we go to, I can almost guarantee somebody's going to have a test kit in the back of their truck in direct sunlight. Maybe it's on the, uh, the cart with their vacuum cleaner that hangs on the tow hitch, or it's in the back in a little tote thing or how everyone's got their own little system. We see them in direct sunlight all day, every day. That is really bad for a test kit, no matter what type it is. Reagent test kits, especially extreme heat ruins reagents. I'm, I don't know enough to know how fast that happens. I just know you're not supposed to do it. Um, test strips, I extreme heat can ruin the reagents on those strips inside the can or inside the bottle, whatever you would call it. So the first part of neglecting it is where do you store it? The second part is how do you maintain it? Okay, so the storage one, direct sunlight is obviously a problem. Uh, extreme cold is also a problem. But the best known practice to replace this habit with is treat that test kit like it's valuable. Put it in your truck. Put it out of direct sunlight, like under the seat in the back of your truck or something like that, that it's not getting, uh, definitely not on your dashboard. You know, like put it somewhere in there and in a place like Phoenix or Palm Springs where it gets really hot in the summer. One of the best things I've seen is put it in a cooler. Try to keep it as regular on temperature as you can because the most accurate tests that you can have will give you the most accurate advice on how to treat that pool. So that's maintaining it in storage. On those hot summer nights in Phoenix, I know it could be over 100 degrees. Bring the test kit inside. Take it with you. It's the most valuable thing you have. Take Sleep it with, with it. You. Take care of it. <laughs> Snuggle up, up, snuggle up next sleep to it. Sleep with it. Oh, sleep with your. I, I picture. <laughs> sleep, sleep. I picture this thing kit. in like a velvet crown royal bag in a inside of a com, combination safe. Oh I'm gonna totally gosh. do a video oh, for you where it's it. in a safe, this, like in the sounds, passenger. This sounds passenger like seat. an April Fool's video <laughs> all over. it. That would be so funny. Totally doing it. Just need. We're gonna find a safe. And the test kit's like, are you cheating on me? And you see a, 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 like a bottle of test strips over there. Are you with that stripper? Oh, uh, oh <laughs> that, man, that's so good. I love there's it. there's so many opportunities with this analogy. That's great. <laughs> Don't okay. Uh, bad habit number seven. Don't sleep with your test kit, <laughs> especially if there's test strips nearby. <laughs> you guys are ridiculous. I thought this was a professional <laughs> podcast. And here I am being outgunned on bad jokes. Oh, didn't Harold tell you? Hey, you asked for it in the webinar. If you, you wanted the. You wanted okay, it. That's fair. I asked. I just said I wanted to know what the trash talk yeah, was. Yeah, there you go. You guys are just showing me up on this. I, I'm I'm kind of upset with myself. <laughs> that I didn't come up with that, but good for you. No, that's good. 
But I, okay, you know, uh, back to the, the real topic. <laughs> yeah, back to the real topic. Great. Take care. Take, do take care of your test kits, though. Yeah. Uh, all exaggeration aside, if it's really hot or really cold outside, bring it indoors. Keep it in room temperature. Keep it out of direct sunlight. Now, that's just storage. The other side to neglecting test kits is letting them get dirty or letting them not be maintained well or letting the reagents expire or not calibrating them. Uh, so electronic test kits, they need to be calibrated. Photometers, like a like a like uh, one of those that you like mash the pill in a sample of water and then you cap it up and it shines light through and tells you what it is. You got to clean those vials. You have to clean the vial on the reagent drop test kit. I see those vials that are just so disgusting and dirty. Well, it's a color comparison. You're supposed to look through that thing mm. and determine what the color is matching. Well, how are you supposed to do that if the whole thing is brown? You're never going to get an accurate reading. So take care of the kits. Every once in a while, be responsible, clean it out. Take some 409 or Windex, clean the thing out, rinse it thoroughly, put it back in. Take care and take pride in the test kit you choose and be aware of the expiration dates. I've seen a lot of expired. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was unaware that they could expire when I first bought, I, I bought a tailor when I first started at a, a Arenda because you know that's what I saw in my area. And it wasn't until last year that I was even aware they had expiration dates because I hardly ever use my test kit. Normally right. when I'm out in the field, I flew somewhere and I'm using my customer's test kit and I was doing a test. I looked at my reagents and made, they expired two years ago. <laughs> yep. None of it, like none of this is like reliable. It, maybe it still worked, but who knows? Like, I don't like the unknown. So just kind of be aware of that, that you should look at expiration dates, calibrate your equipment, keep them clean, keep them stored safe. So that is my third bad habit, which is neglecting test kits. I got to give you or Greg credit. I mean, that's something you implemented, you know, the last year and a half was like, the technicians bringing in their totes every night and putting them in the air conditioned room. I mean, we had Bravo. to make sure they were clean. So and chlorine gas everywhere, but that was another step. And it really helped, I think, prolong those, the life of our test kits. Yeah. And it's something you might not fully know. There's no way you can think that all your equipment is safe in the back of a vehicle when it's a hundred plus degrees outside. And plus you make them aware of when they're bringing, if they do have some kind of caddy or something, you know, bringing, they're holding it into the warehouse or wherever it's going to be stored, that it is actually cleaned up. You know, if they've got paper towels or strips or empty um, bottles or whatever it may be, that they're actually transferring that stuff to the trash. And if they have tabs or anything like that, it's actually going back into buckets and actually... Yeah. Uh, you know, going think, through all those steps. I think we saw it give them like a sense of pride too, which was really cool that we didn't maybe foresee, but they, they started to kind of compete on whose was cleaner. I love that. And, and, and that there's a psychological aspect to that. You make up a very good point. Well, we would actually, we would actually get excited because if there was a technician's truck that was on point, man, but we Call were actually yeah. excited, but like, damn. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. You guys' yeah, truck look like shit. <laughs> yeah, you can't fucking right. match this boy. Kudos. Get out of here. It's got 20 years on you. You can't freaking clean your truck up. Get that sushi give, give, off the dashboard. Give the guy props. Sushi. Give him props where it's due because those little things matter. No, they really that. do. Um, and and you, there's a psychological aspect to the competition of it. You know, reward the guys when they're doing a good job of taking care of their stuff. And then kind of put it in the mindset, I realize there's a difference here. But would you leave your phone in the back of your truck all day? No. Your iPad? <laughs> a, right? Now, there's a bigger theft risk. I get that. There's really no theft risk with a pool test kit unless you're in a distribution parking lot and they're like, ooh, this guy's got an expensive test kit, right? That's because you but own one and you don't own the other. That's why. <laughs> exactly. But we have to have the same kind of mindset of this is valuable. Right. This is a valuable tool. Those I things need are to expensive. keep it in my truck. I need to pull it into my house. That's the kind of thing. That's a great habit to have. And it, again, all these habits, they really cost you nothing. You know, a couple bucks for measuring cups and a thermometer. But other than that, they cost you nothing. These are free habits to change and they're pretty easy to change. I mean, test strips so and reagents were one of the most money we spent per week. I mean, Kyle would get six pack of test strips every two days and then reagents for the ones that were using those. Like it's a, it's a lot of money for a company. And if... 
you know, not a, let alone like if you drop it, the test in water or your hand is wet and you ruin the test mm-hmm. strips inside the container. Like there's a lot. I mean, oh yeah. It's very valuable. You dry very your expensive. hand, shake the bottle, follow manufacturer instruction, shake the bottle till one or two strips comes out, grab the end of the strip, pull it out and then, you know, close the bottle, Th- those kind of things, follow instructions. So uh, that is my third bad habit. We have two more to go. Shall we move on? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. This one's a little bit dense and I'm going to just paraphrase and I will tell your audience to look into this. Number one, this is not any information that we, uh, it sounds like we made it up. We did not make any of it up. All of this information is available on our website, in our blog, and we hyperlink out to the studies and the white papers and all the research that backs this up. (laughs) Yeah. Let's be careful of this rabbit hole. Let's reference it. (laughs) We're not going down this rabbit hole, but basically the bad habit is chasing pH. People try to keep their pH 7.4 to 7.6 all the time because the textbook says to do that. And there's a lot of consequences to that. But if you have outdoor pools with cyanuric acid, the research shows that the pH largely doesn't have much of an impact on the strength of your chlorine anymore. And I want to be clear what I mean by that. You still have chlorine. What you want to avoid, though, is overstabilizing it. So if cyanuric acid is present, and and guys, this is a huge paradigm shift. It cannot be overstated. The pH we have all been taught controls the strength of the chlorine, that the lower your pH, the stronger your chlorine. And the reason for that is it's got a higher percentage of hypochlorous acid, which is the, the badass killing form of chlorine. That all goes out the window in a stabilized pool. We're not making it up. All of this is cited research. You can look at the charts. You can read the papers if you want to nerd out like I had to do. It's real. Cyanuric acid takes over. So the pH could be eight and you could still have the same strength of chlorine, relatively speaking, as 7.0 if you have cyanuric acid. So the pH is almost irrelevant to the strength of your chlorine. It's still a monster factor on the LSI. So I'm not saying pH doesn't matter. I'm saying that with cyanuric acid in your water, it doesn't control the strength of your chlorine anymore. What you have to pay attention to is the free chlorine to cyanuric acid ratio. That's what's going to drive the speed, or in this case, strength of chlorine, because chlorine is all about speed. So contact time, et cetera. Tell the Mike Tyson analogy. (laughs) So I didn't do it on Facebook, but yeah, Mike Tyson. If Mike Tyson were to punch you in the face, I mean, if he punched me in the face, I'd probably have to go to the hospital. I'd be knocked out if he didn't break bones in my jaw. He's Iron Mike, right? And part of what made Mike Tyson so formidable and so dangerous was not that he was bigger or stronger than guys like Evander Holyfield, because he wasn't. He was faster. He was so good because he was so fast. He could hit you so fast and force his mass times acceleration. Chlorination is about speed speed and power. So it takes contact time to kill germs and algae and anything else as a sanitizer. If you slow that down, it's effectively weaker because now it cannot do its job as fast. So it's less powerful. So if Mike Tyson punched you at full speed, you'd go to the hospital probably. But what if he punched you in slow motion, like real slow? It's like, here it comes, buddy. Here it comes. Coming to your chin. Come to your chin. Get ready for it. Here it comes. Oh, yeah. And then by the time, please don't sue me. Oh, that's awesome. By the time, by the time it gets to your face, you might get I mean, punched you after this. time to react and it doesn't even hurt really. I mean, it's kind of a comical, right? But he's still Mike Tyson. He's still just as strong. He's no weaker than he was. He's just slower. And effectively, it doesn't hurt. The impact isn't the same. That's what overstabilization does to chlorine. You still have it, but it just takes longer for it to do its job. So pH goes out the window on the percentage of hypochlorous acid because at 7 it's like just under 3%. And at 8 it's just a little bit lower than that. It's pretty much at the floor. So it's a negligible thing. Don't chase pH with the expectation that it's controlling your chlorine. It is not controlling the strength of your chlorine. It is an LSI factor. So that's the first half of this bad habit. The second half is understanding the physics of what pH is actually trying to do. pH is a reactionary chemistry. 
That's the best way I can explain it. It reacts to other things that are going on and it's an equilibrium. So it bounces, it moves a lot. I'll ask you guys, you had a pool service company. Could you keep pH still for 10 minutes? <laughs> Not very easily. 10 Can minutes anybody? maybe, but. <laughs> I mean, even with chemical controllers, they, they're constantly either feeding acid or they're yeah. feeding dissolved bicarb. I mean, they're constantly battling it, right? Mm-hmm. CO2, acid, whatever it is. That's because physics does not want pH to be 7.4 to 7.6. That's where the textbook wants you to be there. And the reason the textbook wants you to be there is for the strength of chlorine. Now, on an indoor pool or, or any pool that has zero cyanuric acid, yes, pH absolutely controls the strength of your chlorine, no doubt. That's without any stabilizer. But let's be real. Most of your audience, we're talking about outdoor backyard pools. Some commercial, but they're outdoor and they got stabilizer. Fair statement? Mm-hmm. Yep. So this is a very pertinent message. Physics actually wants your pH to be about 8.2. That's the ceiling. We don't need to go into it. Again, all of this is on Arenda Tech's blog. You can find it there, hyperlinked. It, you see it all there. But when gases equalize, basically, the percentage of carbon dioxide in water has to equalize with the atmosphere above the water. And of course, the atmosphere that we all share around the world, your backyard pool is not going to make a blip of difference in that. So we know pretty much what the constant is. Your pool is going to off-gas carbon dioxide to equalize with the same percentage in the atmosphere. And that percentage happens to be 8.2 pH, whether you like it or not. So I don't care how good you are. That's where the water's trying to go. But the closer you get to it, the slower it moves. So instead of correcting down and chasing pH to try to keep it 7.4 to 7.6, that's a ridiculous strategy. You'll never win. And anybody listening to this who's been trying to do that already kind of knows it's painstaking because it's, if you're fighting physics, I don't care how good you are, you're not going to win. So instead of chasing pH and trying to control it, the habit change here is contain it and don't worry about it getting up to something like 7, 9, or 8, 0, or even 8, 1, or 8, 2. The ceiling's 8, 2. It's not going over there unless it's forced. So how do you build an LSI strategy around a higher pH while knowing where the floor is? And what we have found at Arenda doing a lot of work with our calculator and a lot of infield experimentation, it's probably better to set your pH every week to about 7, 6, or even 7, 7, and only go that low. And the reason is you're already that much closer to 8.2. It's going to be slower to change. So if you, uh, this is a, this is a bad habit right here. A lot of people are like, oh man, my pH is always eight every week that I get back there. Instead of going to seven, four, I'm going to go to seven Oh this week. Cause I don't want it to be eight next week. And of course, when they get back, it's actually higher than eight because the rubber band thing, like the LSI, the further away from the target, the faster it reacts and fights back. So it's actually rebounding faster because you went too low. I don't want you to go too low on the pH. If you really want to save a ton of money and a ton of stress, only worry about containing the pH between something like 7.5 or 7.6 at the lowest and let the ceiling be 8.2 naturally. And what you'll find is when you do this with a good amount of calcium hardness to reinforce it, That's another rabbit hole. But uh, if you have an LSI strategy, basically, if you set it to 7.6 every week, you're going to start getting this so dialed in that when you come back uh, the next week, seven days later, you're going to start being able to predict what your pH is with almost absolute certitude. And it's not going to take you long to figure out what it is because that pool is going to be slightly different than everyone else, but it's going to be about 7.9 or 8.0 naturally. Don't freak out. You are not doing anything wrong. That's exactly what it was supposed to do. And now you take a measured amount of acid and bring it back down to 7.6. That's your correction. Mm -hmm. That's the habit. Contain pH. Don't freak out when it goes up to 8. If it goes over 8.2, it was forced. Uh, You guys had any pools on your route that had like vanishing edges, like overflow infinity walls? Yeah, that aerated all the time. Bingo, yep. aeration. Uh, people who run their spa all night, you know, they have, or they all day, they have splash features. Aeration drives CO2 out faster. If there's algae in a pool, algae consumes CO2. 
pulls it out of solution, pH goes up. So these factors will get the pH higher, but the big factor, which ties into my final habit, the big factor is overcorrecting with acid and etching pools. That is the number one reason that, in, in my experience, that's the number one reason why pH goes over 8.2. It's etching pools. So if you ever have a pH way over 8.2, it was forced. It did not naturally get there. So that's my second habit. I How did I do? Tyler, you heard the the actual yeah. rabbit hole last week. <laughs> I feel like I did pretty well not going yeah, down yeah. it this time. Yeah. You definitely did. No, you gave a good um, overall view of it. And like you said, I think if they want more information, they can they can dig into it. And we'll put links to it. But no, you did good. Yeah, you can go forever on that. Ever, you know, oh, so, I could but, talk for yeah, we could talk for hours <laughs> about that. So, were were you recently talking in a quick yes. Facebook video? <laughs> You're at a green pool, and you were talking about the pH and all yeah. of that. That was pretty cool. You want to talk about that a little bit? Just kind of real quick, what you found there? Yeah, sure. It, it shocked me. So I'm at a green pool cleanup in Charlotte, and we weren't quite on quarantine yet, but it was like shelter in place kind of thing, but the pool service trade is still essential in North Carolina. So I got a customer here, calls me up, says, Hey, I got a green pool. Let's go do the arenda treatment on it. And we have this cool thing and I want to film it. it involves phosphate remover and enzymes and you shock with chlorine. And there's a, there's a practice that we do. And I wanted to film it. So we get there and we start testing the water and drop kit only goes up to 8.0. Well, of course it's Barney purple. It's like way higher than 8.0. He said, well, I just got this T this, uh, this pH wand, this little pH meter. Let's try that. It's brand new out of the box. So he put it in there. 10.3 pH. Whew. Now that's freaking cool. I never knew <laughs> something could measure it that high. It just in the blink of an eye, 10.3 pH. Well, Needless to say, I bought that pH meter and TDS meter <laughs> at, when I got home that day because that, that was so cool to see. 10.3, I thought, man, that is way over 8.2. That is way higher than I thought it could possibly be. Of course, we're in a swamp pool. You can't see six inches into it. That much algae had to consume CO2, so it pulled it out of solution. So the percentage of CO2 actually able to be measured in the water is way lower than it normally would be because the algae consumed it. Normally, pH is only trying to equalize with the air above it. You still have a lot of CO2 in your water relative to an algae bloom, which is going to consume it. So that just shocked me. I had no idea. And for those of you listening that don't realize how dramatic the difference in pH can be, every whole number in pH is 10 times more or less than the next whole number. So 10.3 is 10 times more basic than 9.3. And it's 100 times more basic than 8.3. So if the limit is 8.2, it's over 100 times more basic than where physics wanted that pH to be. And I thought that was just crazy. I'm glad you brought that up. So I'm actually in the process of doing some extra research to write a blog about that. But yeah. it's not going to be ready for a while. Let's put that video follow this when we're done because I thought that was a cool little video mm -hmm. about everything going on. So we talked to Dave and Matt about how their Riptide Pool Vacuum is transforming the swimming pool industry in episode 86. Have you listened to it yet? If not, what are you waiting for? The Riptide Vacuum has many innovative features such as a locking bag ring, a quick disconnect power cable, a 10-year warranty on the vacuum case, and much more. We all know that efficiency is key in our industry and the Riptide will greatly increase your productivity. The Riptide can filter all the way down to 60 micron for fine debris and is a beast when it comes to heavy debris and leaves. So start working easier and get through your route faster today. To order your Riptide Vacuum, Head on over to RiptideVac.com, where they even offer 0% financing to qualified buyers. And as a special bonus to our listeners, you can use coupon code POOLCHASERS during checkout to get free shipping and two free vacuum bags. So we have, uh, right, we have one more. Mm -hmm. And we I have, have one more too. You guys go first. <laughs> or do you want to anchor this relay? 
what do we want to do? What do we want to do? Yeah, the pressure's on you. One? I don't know what your second one is. It's the mystery for me. I think you guys should anchor <laughs> oh, you're unless already... you think it sucks compared to mine. <laughs> I th- weren't you already? You are already getting into this. I'm going to let you finish that because you were already, you rolled into abusing the asset. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, you're you're a real gamer, man. I, I like that. You're, <laughs> you're, the, you're the competitive spirit who... Uh, wants to take the pressure on and anchor the relay. I approve of that. <laughs> I will go I will go first and acquiesce to you gentlemen who run the show. <laughs> the number one, by far, number one worst habit, most common, most prevalent, most consequential habit that we see nationwide is the abuse of muriatic acid. There's all sorts of variations of how you can abuse it. So I use that broad term with impunity. Abusing acid generally comes from not measuring it, not dosing it right, not adding it right. And and when it comes to startups and all these other remedies for issues, way, adding way too much of it, using as a, as a fix when it shouldn't really be used as a fix, acid is used as the coverall duct tape of the pool industry in so many ways. And the point I'm trying to make here is around the country, nobody invites Arenda to the good pools. They only invite us to the problem, like mystery problem pools. Most people can handle problems, but when they can't handle problems, that's when we get the call. And I will tell you, without exaggeration, over 90% of those calls are because of abusive acid. That's astounding to me. So... What is abuse of acid? We talked earlier about doubling the dose of acid because we start, we're not measuring it, right? Or we're not dosing it right. Or we don't know the volume of the pool, so we don't get an accurate dose. So obviously adding twice the amount of acid is going to be problematic because you're going to overcorrect the pH, which overcorrects the LSI, which causes etching, which brings out a high pH calcium hydroxide, which kind of neutralizes that. But you took away twice the alkalinity. It's, it's a cluster. It's a big problem in a lot of different ways. But that's just a chemical consequence. There's also a cost associated with those chemicals to fix that problem. But what I want to talk about in this one, since we've already covered the measuring and all that stuff, what I want to talk about is how you add acid to the pool. There's a myth in this industry that I believed for the first two or three years that I was in it. In fact, I didn't know it was a myth until probably last fall, six, seven months ago, I was always told column pouring will reduce alkalinity faster and it will have less of an impact on pH if you just stand in one place and pour acid in a column because it'll burn off alkalinity faster and have less impact on pH. Well, that's a myth. And I'm going to debunk that. And by the way, I did not come up with this. I'm I'm relaying information that is available online. I actually heard this information from On Balance, who did a dye test of acid going into a pool. It is freaking cool. And with their permission, I put pictures of that on our blog. So you can see the picture of the dye test that, that they did. Fascinating to see what it is. Muriatic acid's density is 18% more than water. That doesn't necessarily sound like a lot, but in hydrodynamics, that's a huge amount. What it does is acid plunges to the bottom of the pool. It's like basically unobstructed, just punches right to the bottom of the pool. What do you think the pH at the bottom of the pool is when you do that? Zero. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, yeah, muriatic acid Close is like it. half of one. Mm-hmm. It's, over, it's over a million times more acidic than neutral water. So when it gets to the bottom, maybe two, yep. maybe three, still severe LSI violation. So of course it pulls calcium out because the water is always trying to balance itself on the LSI. The only way it can remedy such a low pH is to find calcium. Well, it's not just looking for a lot of calcium. It's looking for calcium saturation. So the most soluble form of calcium available is within that cement. It's calcium hydroxide, which has a very high pH of 12.6. So this slugging myth, slugging, column pouring, same thing. It's supposed to, I'm using air quotes to you, uh, Radio Waves (laughs) podcast listeners. It's supposed to lower the alkalinity and burn off more alkalinity than it changes pH. 
Well, the reason that happens, it does happen. The reason that happens is yes, it burns off alkalinity, but it pulls a high pH substance out, which neutralizes a lot of the acid that you just poured in. So you don't see the same impact on the pH. That's why it appears that you're making more of an impact on the alkalinity than you are on the pH. But obviously that's a bad thing because you can't put that calcium back into the surface. In reality, the truth is, and there are studies that show this, it does not matter how you add acid to a swimming pool. Alkalinity or sorry, alkalinity is a linear adjustment. So you can pre-dilute it like you're supposed to, and you will reduce the exact same parts per million of alkalinity as if you slug it or if you pour it directly around the perimeter. It does not matter. You will burn off part per million per part per million of alkalinity no matter how you add it. There is zero, zero benefit to column pouring. There is only downside. So if you are actually trying to do acid responsibly, you have to pre-dilute and pour it around the perimeter. So far, that's the best known practice. We don't know of any exceptions to this. Absolutely never put acid in a skimmer. I think that that's common sense. But yet, people put trichlor in skimmers. The pH of trichlor is 2.8. That's acid, people. That's acid. And it's stabilizer. It's just a different conversation. But when you put trichlor in a skimmer, it's going to chew up your equipment. This is, And then they see issues like copper staining in their pool. Well, yeah, it stripped the copper out of your heat exchanger. Okay, makes sense. If you slug acid or column pour it, it goes down to the bottom. It gets pulled into the main drain. And it strips out the copper in your heat exchanger because the pH is so low. So what we really have to do is, number one, we have to measure the acid properly. But how we add it changes everything. We have to reduce the density difference. We have to dilute this acid. We want to dilute it 10 to 1. So in a, you know, take a five-gallon bucket, take half of it, and what's that, 2.5 gallons, right? So if you just put a quart in that, I think my math is right. That should be 10 to one, maybe a half a quart. Do the math. 10 to one is what you want to hit and pre-dilute it and only you know, sit for 10 seconds, count to 10 and then pour that in. You will still get the exact same amount of muriatic acid in that pool. Agreed? Yes. Same amount. So you're going to get the exact same alkalinity adjustment as you should. And you're going to get the proper pH correction that you were supposed to get. And of course, since we're no longer abusing acid and we're not chasing pH, we're not putting that much acid in anyway. We're not trying to lower the pH below 7.4. We're trying to hit 7.6, maybe 7.7, which is a much more responsible way to keep your pH in line because you're containing it. So pre-dilute in a bucket of water, 10 to 1, and then distribute. And you stop so many problems, not just surface problems, but equipment problems, uh, chemical costs, you're no longer overcorrecting. I mean, there's so many benefits to this. And so what I wanted to talk about with the habit is how do you make such a change? I got pictures. I showed it on our webinar. We got them in the blog. I have an entire file on my computer of all the, just the horror files of the bad things that acid has done to swimming pools. And it is astounding. And one thing they all share in common is they were either misdosed or they were poured directly into the pool. And I'm talking I'm talking costly stuff here. We're talking replasters, we're talking drain and acid washes, repolishings. That's not cheap. That's not free. And when I was talking to a bunch of people in the UPA and a couple of IPSA chapters, those groups are great. But they're all about insurance. And if you're irresponsibly using acid, if you guys want a way to mitigate your risk, those of you listening, this is the biggest problem I see around the country, bar none. And I, I speak for everyone at Arenda when I say that, bar none. And in terms of risk of an insurance claim of a destroyed surface or something like that, pay attention to this problem. Do not slug acid. Do not call and pour acid. Measure it. Get the dosing right, pre-dilute it, put it around. If you guys just do that, I wouldn't have to travel nearly as much. And <laughs> it would be 
so much better for your homeowners. It's going to be so much better for your bottom line as well. And your risk is going to go way down and you're going to have your chemistry under control. So that's it. Abusive acid, hands down, biggest problem. Uh, I am now off of my soapbox. Oh, that was great <laughs> stuff. I mean, do you have a recommendation or if in after you're diluting the acid to actually pouring into the pool? Yeah. yeah. So you want to count to 10 and then you want to pour it around the perimeter starting in the deep end. Don't do it like right in front of a skimmer, but I suppose it won't really matter because it's going to sink a little bit anyway, but go around the perimeter of the deepest part of the pool and try to cover. I mean, if it's a huge pool, you can't cover half, but try to just walk at a decent pace, spread it around. But what, what, what diluting 10 to one does is it gives it time. It's still going to try to sink, but it's not going to plunge to the bottom. It, st- it gives the acid time to dilute further in the pool so that its pH is actually going up and it's actually burning off alkalinity and neutralizing before it hits the bottom of your pool. That is so key. And the way you structure a habit on this is I, I tell everyone they need at least one clean bucket in their truck. And put when you're getting ready to go into a backyard, put the gallon of acid and a glove and a measuring cup in that bucket and then just carry the bucket in with all your equipment. And then now you have the bucket, which reminds you to dilute. You have a measuring cup and a glove, which reminds you to measure. And this habit will form itself. But how many times, I mean, guys, everybody's guilty of this. It's not an indictment on any one person. Everybody has poured acid directly in the pool. Two years ago, I did it. And yeah. I'm not a service guy, but I was there trying to help out a service guy that I was on route with. And I call him poured because that's what I thought was the right thing to do. I feel horrible about it now, but Hey, I never wondered why the bottom of the pool at that time was slightly lighter than the rest of the pool. Go on our website, read the blog, look at the dye tests that on balance did look at what muriatic acid does and it plumes up and no wonder the bottom of the pool is going to be lighter than the rest of it. Acids gravity is heavier. So, I get pretty passionate about this and I'll explain why I'm more passionate about this than all the other ones. This is people's livelihoods. This can make or break a company enough warranty calls, enough insurance claims or lawsuits of resurfacing. I mean, that can break somebody and I've seen it happen more, more than once. I don't want to ever see it happen again, guys. This habit is totally free to change. If you don't have a clean bucket on your truck, Go to distribution, find an old trichlor bucket, rinse it out thoroughly, and there you go. You have a bucket. How cool is that? It's very easy. <laughs> Just do it. Just right. do it, please. I'm pleading with you. <laughs> I we, have nothing to gain. Arenda has no dog in this fight, except we care about the industry. We care about you guys. Pre-dilute and dispense around the perimeter of the pool. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty serious about this one. Back yeah, to you guys. We can tell. <laughs> no, and that's well, good. No, I think seriously, that's awesome. like people, companies have gone under largely yeah. because of this problem. For right. sure. I think if anybody who is column pouring, they're going to probably do it in the same spot every week and not even realize it because you're trying to do it in the deep end or whatever, and you're just damaging those surfaces every time. Yep. I never thought about it really much either until, you know, listening to you talk about it. So that's a really good point. Yeah. And I think um, we'll put a link in there too, but uh, Uline actually has color coded buckets that you can buy and you can actually get an orange bucket. And we had labels towards the end that each <laughs> bucket had a certain label on it so that you knew that that was specifically for that particular item. Oh, that's genius. I love it. I'm going to say you want to come pick some up. I think we got like. 40, I've got a whole left. stack of <laughs> brand new UN hey, buckets. Those of you in Phoenix, uh, yeah. their address is blank, blank, blank something in Scottsdale. Yeah. But we got uh, one final topic and talked about this many times, and that's the cleansing. This is yours. And this is your bad habit. This, this is, is yeah. the, the grand poobah. This is the finale. I love it. Yeah. What is it, guys? Hit me with it. Not our bad habit, but definitely a uh, pet peeve, oh. the worst pet peeve. Um, but that's you know, an organized work vehicle and can't tell you how many times we've seen really messy trucks. And that is down to efficiency. It's a safety hazard. There's all kinds of things that tie into this, but we always thought it was a really 
a good idea of thinking about, you know, the technician sits in the driver's seat and thinking about the walking path that they're taking in order to get items and where they're parked on the street and where the pool for the most part is actually going to be. So it's looking at the walking pattern and how things can actually be reached and actually having almost like a chart, bed of your truck, a chart of where everything is supposed to be and printing that out and keeping it in the truck so that everybody knows that acid goes here, liquid chlorine can go here, you know, shock, acid, um, you know, your hoses, all the different things that a truck has. That way you're taking all the the questions out of it. They just know where everything goes. And I think that it it makes people feel um, proud about, you know, what they do, because, you know, if you look at a really good electrical company or plumbing company, they have these huge work trucks and everything is extremely organized. You would think that that thing was pulling into doctor's office or something. It's just so, it's just so tight and clean, but we think that we should treat the pool industry, especially the service side, um, just as serious and making sure that everything is very tight and clean for sure and take pride in this industry guys because uh i at because i wasn't a pool guy i didn't appreciate it but i've gone on enough service calls and like name another profession where you have to be an electrician a plumber sometimes a carpenter a cleaner a chemist i mean you got to do a you have to have a lot of skills to be a good pool person and you know if you hire a a plumber to come to your house to do something. And he shows up in a shoddy vehicle that's dirty and messy and trash in it. The dashboard's full of McDonald's trash and all this stuff. I, you know, I I only had to get one thing done in my house, but I don't know. And then you see that crisp service vehicle come up where it's painted nice. It's clean. The guy comes out and he puts on the little uh, boot socks to come into your house. They, They, you know, they respect the space. Those little things make me a lot more confident. I will pay more money for the cleaner appearance of the business, even if they're not as good of a technician because of the professionalism of it, you nailed it. I, I think that's a great one and dirty trucks, man. I, and not that is only, a problem. not only that piece of it and the pride, but running in the repair division of a company, like there were so many times where Kyle and I would call the technicians and say, Hey, you know, you have this in your truck and then, like, no, I don't. I'm like, yeah, you do because Kyle checked it this morning and, you know, went through the list of everything and it's on your truck. Well, I can't find it. I got to go to distribution. I got to make this extra trip. So they're going back and wasting time, wasting their time, wasting your time, wasting the customer's time wasting and gas. wasting gas. I mean, it's, it's a big, big waste. And, you know, having an organized vehicle, like we had go kits, which we've talked about before that had every O-ring in it, everything that were, that was checked every night, but, you know, an organization piece that is able to for the technician to know exactly what's on the truck and where it is and where to find it and that way you are much more efficient it's very annoying (laughs) as an owner to to hear like i don't have one of those and then you get back to the shop i find it and i just had to buy two of those because you couldn't find the one that you already had so it's really really guys this is your mobile office yeah this is this is the front of your business that homeowners see they don't they're not walking into your warehouse now, warehouses should be clean too, but this is what is customer facing. Clean your truck. Keep yeah. the trash to a minimum and clean it out. When you go to distribution, they all have dumpsters. You know, when you go home, you have trash cans. You, you know, well, I'm not the I'm not the cleanliness police by any means of customers. That's not my space. I'm not in the business of telling people how to run their business. But if you're going to take advice from a totally unqualified pool guy, but a guy who has seen nothing but problems for the last three years and a high concentration of them. I've been all over the country. That is a huge problem that I do see. So kudos to you guys for calling it and bringing it up. Um, It it definitely matters. Professionalism does matter. And if you want to start attracting the higher end clientele rather than the cheapest guy on the block and you're competing on price, you have to dress the part. Have standards for sure. It's been a long time since I heard it or saw it, but that millionaire pool man that came out a long time ago, that's like one of the big pieces of it is, is the professionalism. It's the biggest sure. piece. I think, you know, this goes for everything. When you see a problem, feel a problem, 
why is it a problem? Write it down, do something about it. These aren't, these are all things that we know and do because we went through it and it was like, okay, that truck looks like shit. This one looks really good. I like the one that looks really good. How, yeah. how do we make them all look good? And you start to figure out how you need to put all those pieces together. But yep, that was uh, that was ours. That was the last one we had I to contribute. That, that's uh, a great one. What a way to anchor this. I think that's a great message. And thank you guys for having me on to share these habits. And I kind of in closing, the whole idea behind these six habits. At the beginning, I said I at first I was just kind of like I wanted to change it up because I never I always teach the same material: four pillars, LSI, startup, all that stuff. I really wanted to, to teach something that was very easy for people to grasp, a very simple action step. So to recap this whole thing of my six, and then you guys, if you can, for each of yours, come up with a, a simple action step. The first one I said was measure pool chemicals. The action step is have a measuring cup for liquid and have a, a separate measuring cup for dry chemicals and use them. That's your action step for the first one. The second one was the pool volume, measure the pool volume, contact the pool builder. And if that's not an available option, uh, measure it out and get as close as you can. The, I forgot to mention, there is a chemical way using titration of alkalinity. It's pretty complex, but we hyperlink to it in our website. If you have all the time and you want to put on a lab science coat, you can actually get really accurate on a volume. This is probably worth it only for those really complex shaped fancy pools with a customer that you cannot lose. Like you've got to be on your absolute A game. This is a great solution for that pool. If you don't know the volume, take the time, it, but it's going to take you probably an hour at least to do that. Uh, but it's in our website, in our how to measure a pool blog, there's a hyperlink to it. The next one is don't ignore water temperature. If that's easy. Use a thermometer. Apply it to the LSI calculator. Easy action step. Uh, the next one is uh, don't neglect test kits. Sleep with them, as Greg said. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The action step for that is treat it like it's a valuable tool. Treat it just as important as your phone. Um, you know, Keep it inside your vehicle. If it's really hot or really cold outside, bring it into your house at night. Do not leave it out in the back of the test, in the back of the sun. Don't leave it in the bed of your truck all day. It cannot handle that heat. And then uh, calibrate them, keep them clean, keep the vials clean, you know, make sure you're looking at reagents, just take care of your test kit. And then don't chase pH is the second to last habit. Set your framework with the LSI. Don't worry about lowering it below seven, six or so, because it does not control the strength of your chlorine if there's cyanuric acid in the pool. And again, we've hyperlinked to all that. So instead of lowering it too much, Lower the pH only down to 7.6, maybe even 7.7, 7, and let it climb to 8 because physics is going to take it there anyway, and don't freak out about it. Contain pH. Don't try to control it. And finally, abusing acid, measure it. Well, dose it right, measure it right, and add it right. That means pre-diluting it in a bucket 10 to 1 and adding it around the perimeter. If you, Guys, if you do those six habits... If you are not more profitable next month over this month, I will be shocked. Mm -hmm. I will be shocked. Now, and that's notwithstanding COVID-19 or anything like that. Just based comparison, pool for pool, you should see a big difference in your acid consumption and your profitability. So guys, take us home. What's the action steps for yours? Yeah, I talked about not using your phone too much and utilizing your time to the best of its abilities. I think that to make those steps happen. Like we talked about, you take the pictures or whatever and plan out your social media posts, take into account how much time is taking you to be on your phone, ask these questions. If the question's not important um, to ask at that moment, take the time later to ask it, but get through the work first. Make sure that you are taking the time to do each pull correctly, not being distracted by being on the phone, not being distracted by talking on the phone, but really you know, focusing on each pull as you go along. And I think that will make a big difference in the time that you're spending out in the field, especially in Arizona makes a big difference, whether you get done at 11 or four o'clock. So <laughs> no, for sure, it's really hot for one thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And the last one, number eight is uh, keeping your vehicle organized and clean and safe and taking all the measures you need in order to 
make that happen. Um, it's not as difficult as some of the other things that we have talked about, but it's definitely an eyesore and it'll allow everybody to take pride in their work vehicle. Um, and that, that's it. That's a wrap. Guys, you were awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's a wrap. Thank you so much for having me on, guys. Yeah, for oh, sure, man. We appreciate it. You know, one more time, where can people uh, find Arenda? So we're all over the internet. So you can find, we have a YouTube channel, Arenda Technologies. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. Again, Arenda Technologies. I think it's at Orenda Tech, T-E-C-H. Our website is orendatech.com. We have a very thorough blog and video section. We also have Orenda Academy and the Arenda Academy Four Pillars, which is kind of like the university level. And those are free online training video series with quizzes, uh, totally free, like I said. And we take education and, and really pay it forward. And we don't ask for anything in return. We just want to get this information out because if we can help you add value to your customers, that's a good thing for all of us. Um, so yeah, if you could follow our stuff, awesome. And I really appreciate you guys having me on and uh, we'll keep doing what we do. You keep doing what you do. All right. Thanks, Thank Eric. You. Stay socially distant, boys. <laughs> you too. Thanks so much. All right. Hey, Pool Chasers. Thanks for checking out this episode. Did you know that each episode has its own page on our website? This is where you can find more information about the guests and episode topic, as well as all the resources that we discuss throughout the show. To get to the webpage, click the link below. Also below, you will find links to the sponsors of the show, as well as links to follow us on our social media channels. On our channels, you will find some of our favorite clips and bonus material. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our tag is Pool Chasers. We also have a Facebook group for the Pool Chasers community. Here you will find like-minded professionals all looking to make each other better. One last thing, if the episode has brought you value, please check out our Patreon page to support us. And if you could please rate and review the podcast, we would love to hear what your favorite topics are. Thank you for your time and your ear. See you out there, Pool Chasers. chasers.